Hello, my name is Aiden. I'm a volunteer with LENR Forum and also run a company called Conscious Energies. Uh, I'm going to be presenting the LENR Forum on Web 3.0. So let's get into this. So here's content outline. What is Web 3.0 in cryptocurrencies or digital assets? Why use Web 3.0 for LENR research? What would the Web 3.0 ecosystem look like? And then we'll come to our conclusion. So first and foremost, for some context, Web 1.0 was the first era of the modern internet, roughly 1990 to 2005, was about small open pro protocols that were decentralized and community governed, uh, small group of nodes and, and some geeks who like computer science who set up networks. Um, and it actually started way before 1990, I should say, but it didn't get popular until 1990. And most of the value accrued on to the edges of the network uh, for users and builders. And primarily it was st static pages and text-based um, web queries and, and, and servers that you would go to. So Web 2.0, the second era of the internet, roughly 2005 to present day, it still has many features of Web 2.0, but we could say 2020 was about siloed and centralized services. Most of the value accrued to just a handful of large tech companies and interactive pages with mobile functionality. So you were able to uh, upload as well as download content and, um, and streaming services and social networks became a thing. So Web 3.0, we're now beginning the third era of the internet. It roughly started in 2009 with the discovery of Bitcoin and the creation of Bitcoin. Um, but what many call Web3, it combines a decentralized community of governed ethos of the network era with the advanced modern functionality of the second era. So I should say the first era, by apologies. And this will unlock a new wave of creative and entrepreneurship, creativity and entrepreneurship using digital property assets. We'll get more into that. So we'll just take a look at the evolution of the web. Uh, web 1.0 had things like Netscape, Yahoo, Internet Explorer. A lot of these things have been shelved <laughs> no longer. Well, I should say Net Netscape still exists. It just doesn't, it's not really used that much. Um, but Internet Explorer has been shelved. And Yahoo, I don't know how many people go to that, maybe for finance news. But um, so Web 1.0 is really kind of one directional static page situation. Um, and then Web 2.0 is uh, more circular in that you could upload download content, you can interact a lot more, and it had um, you know more interactive services um, and networks started to develop, social networks started to develop like Facebook, and you were also able to do CRM, and there's a lot more uh, user contribution and user uh, ability to, to create and inter interact. Then we go to what is now Web 3.0, we'll move into Web 3.0, which is that people will be able to have ownership in Web 3.0. They actually can put their energy, their their money to to more creative things and be able to have property rights on the internet. Um, it also opens up a huge door for uh, not only uh, ownership of stuff, but the ability to upload uh, real time, real world data that can have a digital twin, as it's called, or a representation on the internet. So um, sensor information and, and things of that nature um, using oracles, but I won't go too much into that stuff. So what is Web3? Web3 is the development for a new iteration of the World Wide Web based on blockchain technology, which incorporates concepts such as decentralization and token based economics. Web3 really the term Web3 came about by a gentleman named Gavin Wood, who worked with the Ethereum Foundation and then went off to make his own project um, called Polkadot in Kusama. Uh, he kind of he's a computer scientist that kind of really came up with the, 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 the name for Web3, even though many cypherpunks and people in the past have talked about, you know, decentralizing and democratizing the Internet. So Web3 can provide decentralized value exchange. So digital property rights, like we talked about data security peer-to-peer -peer network scalability, governance, privacy, and project transparency and authenticity. The flaws of Web2, um, for context, uh, big tech oil gopolies, so centralized servers that would kind of control and dominate the, the, the data, data streams. They could say they can censor certain content and they get a majority of the value 
um, using data. So they're able to take the data and sell it to third parties for marketing rights and, and they get paid marketing revenue for, for having people's data. Um, and then digital, digital authoritarianism can happen from either a, a big tech company or from a government that wants to put up a, a, a firewall, block people off and make a walled garden and, and um, also censorship and be able to, and, and a lack of privacy to be able to track their users and, you know, do what they will. Very scary dystopian type of reality that uh, is already here, unfortunately. So network designs, just again for context, so we kind of know what we're talking about. Um, a big oil oligopoly is like the first centralized uh, network. You know, they have a few main servers, databases um, that are a center point of failure um, and can be controlled by just those people. So if anything happens or if they want to, you know, manipulate the network, they're easily able to um, as it's their hardware. But as we move into more decentralized systems, everybody's hardware can contribute to um, a database or just a mechanism of a, like a ledger of transparency, um, a consensus mechanism that allows everybody to see um, transactions without it being uh, like why it still maintains pseudo anonymity. So people don't have to necessarily, they, they have an identification that's, that's verified, but they don't necessarily have to give up their information or their data. Um, which is a very powerful tool. And ultimately, the best network design to kind of aim for is a distributed network in which if there's a point of failure, the rest of the network can step in and support that one point of failure and be able to um, have a very robust and very fast network that can be done peer to peer. Now we're moving into this is not like it's said and done. There are some, um, there are some certain protocols that, that do operate in a very distributed manner, um, but there's always different like layered networks. So there's different angles of attack um, and different protocols work side by side, like, you know, TCP IP and stuff like that. These are all different protocols that all, all work together. And primarily what we're focused on is just a consensus protocol um, of, of transactions and, and voting rights, like the, the ability to represent yourself pseudonymously. So um, the, evol the evolution of network design features less points of failure with the benefit of peer-to-peer -peer data sharing. So everybody can kind of share and no, there's no one central server to shut everything down if they feel the need to. Distributed networks of Web3. So Bitcoin really allowed open digital money and property networks, the peer-to-peer -peer exchange of value. Bitcoin, for many reasons, was kind of the discovery of the ability to open source protocol, make an open source protocol that anybody can contribute to. And it's a monetary network for the internet that's fair, decentralized and democratized. Um, and so really Web3 is because of Bitcoin, like Bitcoin made Web3 possible. Um, it wouldn't be possible without Bitcoin. So it's very important um, that if you just, if you're new to cryptocurrency that you start with Bitcoin and really dig deep into Bitcoin and realize that that's really the, the true settlement layer for this monetary network on, on the internet. Um, so the distribution of third party financial institutions using multi-layer programmable money networks. So later on other iterations of Bitcoin and then new protocols were designed all open source. That's the, that's the key behind them is that they need to be open source. So anybody can go and read the code and know what they're contrib what they're contributing to or what they're, where they're putting their financial resources to. And there's um, been new developments that create things like smart contracts and uh, an ability to uh, have a trustless legal framework where there's no third party intermediary except for a computer or a computer code. So you can actually have a contract with somebody um, without there being a third party or a government official or something like that to get involved and um, take a fee or have to deal, although fees still do exist, depending on what protocol you use. But in general, it allows um, a very disruptive technology to, to make the liquidity of money move transparently and efficiently through different networks to accomplish shared goals. So uh, financial networks that are interoperable with centralized and decentralized exchanges. So there is centralized exchanges that are 
you know, basically just like a banking service or a brokerage and they will sell Bitcoin and you can exchange there. And there's also decentralized, which just uses a, a automated market maker and uses algorithms and protocols to um, to be able to exchange without that third party middleman. Um, both of these networks are have their advantages and disadvantages um, and their points of failure. I would say that the decentralized finance point of failure has to do with poorly written code, um, hacks and exploits. Um, whereas the centralized, usually the security is a little better, but the point of failure is in risk and financial points of failure um, on the centralized. Whereas the decentralized is very good about uh, being transparent and open for the financial side. And so things happen very quickly and there's no, it's not hidden. It's very transparent. Whereas the centralized exchanges can be very trans, uh, opaque and you can't really tell, they can be very hidden of what their finances look like. So if they are taking on a lot of risk and a liquidity event happens or something happens to the company, they took on too much risk and they have to pay the piper, so to speak, um, they can get in a lot of trouble. And that actually just recently happened uh, because of one network going down. So these are things to keep in mind as you explore um, the cryptocurrency world, the Web3. So digital property rights of Web3. This is really the meat of it. And again, I can't stress this enough, Bitcoin allowed for this to happen. I mean, if it, if it wasn't for Satoshi Nakamoto and the people who spent their energy into making Bitcoin uh, what it is today, then we wouldn't have this iteration of the internet. So um, immutable contracts is the ability to use coding language as the legal intermediary, like I spoke about before. So you don't need a third party person to come in and, and, and uh, be the, uh, Everybody can be that third party vetting process. Everybody can come and look legally in the contra in the code. The code is law. So um, open source networks, uh, creation of open networks of value exchange for aligned individuals and groups. So that will really come to importance in a second as we move forward talking about what a DAO is. And digital sovereignty, the ability to have individual representation on the internet with ownership of digital assets. So this is um, a mutable um, code that you that you can see on the network. It's in your wallet, and your wallet can be anonymous, pseudo anonymous, or completely open and transparent, depending on what the wallet owner or owners wish to do with it. And that's another very key and powerful aspect of transparency, as well as privacy and, and freedom, really liberty and freedom. So. Why use Web3 with LNR research? So Web3 and cryptocurrencies can have an important role in the development of LNR. It is now possible to establish an open network of researchers who can be compensated for their efforts in a decentralized autonomous organization or a DAO. This allows a way to exchange value with transparency, research authenticity, immutability, community treasury for funding, community governance, uh, for democratic voting and pseudo on an anonymity for investors and users alike. Um, so this is going into what a decentralized autonomous organization is a way to have mutual value exchange. So mutual value sharing or mutual value exchange web three allows groups of people to work towards a common goal with mutual benefit. All who participate in the growth of the DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, benefit from the tokenized value proposition of the programmable money. So, as a kind of a way to look back, as you have in Web 2's value sharing model or design, you know the users really get the smallest amount of value. They are they do get value for using the product, and it's you know can be fun, or they can they're able to create, or and and they'll get um, monetary incentives sometimes. But it is nowhere near. If like if they become creators, for example, but it's nowhere near what the original investors or the developers or the builders get. And um, sometimes this is perfectly fine. And I, I'm not dis dis uh, agreeing with people's business models and stuff like that. Some have been very successful, but sometimes it, it also is very um, asymmetrical towards just the original creators. And it can make it hit a brick wall if it's not designed. Um, if it's not designed for a uh, mutual benefit um, and and what i mean by that is uh, people will no longer want to contribute to creating on a platform um, that is that is unfair um, people kind of avoid um avoid having to deal with advertisements and stuff like that um, and 
you know, don't like their data, giving up their data in order for a big company to make a bunch more money, right? So, <laughs> um, you know, it's gives and takes, it's engineering a thing, right? So it's never perfect, nothing's ever perfect. But in Web3's value sharing, it is possible to have a tokenized uh, economy or token, a tokenomic system, tokenized economy, where all members are, are transparently shown and, and there can be more and more of an even and a democratized playing field for the users, creators, builders, developers, so on and so forth. And it can be voted on by the people who are on the network. So um, it can be a majority a majority vote, a majority consensus of people like this this particular design. So we'll move towards that design and create the network that will be mutually benefit for everybody. So it's very powerful uh, governance structure and uh, ability to create some really amazing things together as as an organization rather than just a single entity business or or um, or corporation so treasury and governance these centralized autonomous organizations usually have a treasury just like a foundation um, or any nonprofit it's very much this is like the nonprofit of web3 um, so the LER DAO community is able to vote for fund allocation on experiments, upgrades, project direction, and events. Um, so this is an example of kind of what a, tr uh, a treasury balance sheet would look like. You would have the DAO treasury having the majority, right, of the finances that everybody could vote on which direction that that can go. Then you usually have like some trade liquidity for the exchanges to be able to trade back and forth and for people to do their market speculation and all that kind of stuff because that's usually that's usually the way it goes in a free market. Um, then you have very transparently shown the development, the legal and the marketing. Um, you can have some other aspects of it if you'd like event organizations, whatever. I guess that would still fall under marketing, but you know, you're able to put this out there and then all of that all of that balance sheet data can be attached to a wallet so everybody can see the funds are in this wallet and it's very a transparent process and everybody's able to see where the funds move to after they're voted upon and things of that nature. So it's, it's a really promising tool to have a whole bunch of people work on something together that they all find value in that maybe goes beyond just monetary or financial value but maybe into something more like creating abundant energy. So having an economic model can ensure a DAO's transparency and longevity. Now, NFT hypothesis. So a non-fungible token, NFT, is a cryptographic token which is immutable and verified unique on the blockchain. So there's no other like it. A researcher can submit an NFT hypothesis which can provide proof of a researcher's work as well as give a researcher resale royalties to a publication or experimental protocol they have developed. If the hypothesis proves, proves to be correct, the NFT will become valuable as a moment in history, a new discovery or invention was made. Possible use cases and functions. So open source research and de development with financial compensation. So a lot of times in research and development in an open source protocol, there's not a whole lot of financial incentive for people to, to work on it or to receive compensation for their time. Um, with a model like this, uh, even though it's still open source, people will be able to see the, where it came from, where the source came from, and people can contribute to that, um, be able to send donations to, to a web address, or a, not a web address, but a, send donations to a, a wallet address, uh, or, or be able to buy an NFT or a group of NFTs that really show, like, really show support for a, an engineer or an artist is, is what it's been used for primarily, but... Um, some people would argue that engineers are artists themselves um, or science scientists, creative uh, theoretical scientists. You know, these are all in the frameworks of the more metaphysical or and philosophical realms of, of science and developing a thing. So uh, it has a very powerful use case in value sharing, like like we were talking about earlier. So blockchain verification of experimental authenticity. So this would show that yes, this researcher created this hypothesis at this time, it's immutable, so nobody can get rid of it. And it has like property rights on it, like that, that they made, they made this hypothesis and then showed this discovery to be true. Um, as, after asking nature, the questions, the important questions, uh, and getting the empirical evidence, whatever it may be. And then, um, people can see that that is the experimenter who did it. It's, and, and this is his work. So they can, they can able, they can buy, you know, 
a fraction of rights for it if they want to use it. Um, it depends on really what the what the create the creator or the engineer wants to do with it. Some people will be likely more open and open source. Some people will be more proprietary, like and do things kind of how we've been doing things, and that's fine. And they have that freedom and that choice. Uh, NFT passes to exclusive events and content. So content. So um, if you have and one of these NFTs of this researcher, when they post or publish a new, uh, a new paper or a new experimental protocol, people with that NFT pass can go and actually see, see that experiment, see that protocol, and be able to take the intellectual ideas from it and use it for their own work, or um, be able to share it around and talk about it. Um, also, if there's an event uh, like uh, ICC F25, for example, then um, an NFT pass, people, if you have that NFT pass, you get a discount for coming in or you're free, or you're free to come in, you know, depending on your, your, your NFT or however it's designed. And then there's also resale of research data that pay for royalties to the experimenters or DAO. So like we said above, if, a, if, a finan if the finan financial comp compensation doesn't just have to be just that one time, oh, I really like this, this hypothesis, I'd like to see it done, I'd like to see somebody actually work on it, so they buy the NFT to help the, in, the creator or the person with the hypothesis. Um, later down the road, if they decide that they wanna sell their NFT back into the market, the actual researcher will get royalties from that. So if it's, if it's sold, if the tokenomics are done, done well and it's sold properly, or and it sells back into the market, uh, that researcher continues to collect royalties on that hypothesis, further developing their, their hypothesis and proving if it's right or wrong. And then of course, if, if a hypothesis is incorrect, uh, the NFTs will not be worth anything. So that's always the risk that everyone takes, right? And that's the risk when you, you always take when you're trying to build something or a, whether it be a business or some new technological thing. So collection value, if a hypothesis proved to be scientifically accurate. So I, I already touched on this, but yeah, so if, if it's accurate though, if, if the hypothesis shows there is promise, uh, then there will be value in that NFT. It will increase in value. And like this is, this is, this guy made this thing happen, right? This, he made this reactor work. Um, so the value of that will, will increase, right? So in conclusion, by creating a web three LNR form or LNR DAO, Experimenters and advocates of LENR can collectively develop this important alternative energy technology. By using transparent, democratic, and decentralized blockchain technology, LENR research and development can flourish as an emergent technological human endeavor. So I really appreciate you watching this, taking your time, and, uh, and getting to know why Web3 would be so important on LENR, uh, on, for the LENR forum, and to, to make LENR possible and bring it to light. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me um, at Conscious Energies LLC. Um, you reach out to me on social media at Diet and Axe and uh, reach out to all of us at the LNR forum. Uh, our channels are all open. Uh, we have a Discord now, so I'd be um, very, very appreciative if you um, shared this information, talked about it, uh, poked holes at it, and, and please feel free to contact any of us anytime with any questions. Thank you for watching.